be here. Okay. So if you've been with us over the last little while, we've been journeying together through the book of Hebrews. And uh, tonight we are in chapter 8 of Hebrews, and we're going to be talking about the wonders of the new covenant. We're going to celebrate God's promise in the new covenant together. I feel a little bit echoey still. If we could work on that. Um, but I want, to, I want to start, and maybe let's just rehash the last week, because it's been a good week to be a South African, hasn't it? Right? The box played some flipping great rugby yesterday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's been a long time coming. We've been waiting for it. Do you just go back a week, right, to when we just beat Wales, 19 points to 16. And it was tight. And it was difficult, and we just kind of scraped our way into the final, and we were going in as underdogs against England with Eddie Jones, and there'd been all this hype in the media, and there's all this admin that's been going on behind the scenes, and you're like, oh, the Springboks going to be able to make it, and we just, you know, for the first time in a long time, we managed to win a game that Jerome Garcia was refing, and so we were like really excited about that, and then we see the final, and behold, Jerome Garcia is refing again. I'm still echoing quite a lot here, right? And so you're like, oh man, are we really going to be able to do it? But there's hope, right? There's hope in our hearts because you just, you like, you want to see the box there. You want to see them do it. And you know, like they got into the final. So anything can now happen. You know, so we're excited and we're, we're holding hope for the boys. And then there's this whole story that's been going on with Evan Etzebeth behind the scenes. And it's, and it's kind of like, is it weighing on the guy's hearts? And are they going to make it through? And are they going to have what it takes? I mean, is Fuff just going to box kick the ball for days into touch and waste our possession? Are we really going to get anywhere? And so you carry through the whole week. You're carrying this expectation. You're carrying this hope that perhaps when we get to the final, we're going to play some good rugby. And then yesterday, man, we brought it, eh? And we played some great rugby. And we saw perhaps some of the best rugby the Springboks have played in ages. And I don't know about you, but it was fantastic to be a part of. I was so excited. We were so, like, just, like, my heart rate was at about 100 at half time while we were resting. Right? We were pumped because the guys were playing so well. And what we get to talk about tonight is so much more exciting than the Springboks managing to win the World Cup. Right? I mean, I am so excited for that. I'm stoked that we are the world champions. But guys, the new covenant, the promise of God for us today as Christians is the most exciting news this world has ever got. And we get to celebrate that tonight. And so I want us to, I want us to savor that. I want us to, to just recognize that because sometimes as we begin to talk about the new covenant, it's easy to think, yeah, I kind of know this. And this is kind of Christianity 101, but I want to encourage you as we dig into what God has said for us, what the new covenant is, let's allow it to spark in us and remind us and fan into flame the greatness of our God and His goodness towards us. And let's allow it to cause worship to rise up in us as we see His goodness displayed for us. So that's where we're going to go tonight. And before we get there, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about our story so far so you know where we are. You can track with us. If you've missed some of the messages, you can always find them on YouTube. But uh, the author of Hebrews starts in Hebrews chapter 1. He says, you need to understand that there is no one like Jesus. Jesus is, in fact, the most superior being that has ever existed. In fact, he's greater than all the angels. That's his point. And so he says, in in light of the greatness of who Jesus is, you need to be really careful that you don't neglect the revelation that he brings. Make sure that you obey him, that you follow him, right? And, And he warns us, and he says, because there was another generation that had a great revelation of God. They were the generation that God brought out of Egypt and took them through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land, and they failed to enter. So make sure that you are not like them in light of the revelation that you've had of Jesus, And then he begins to unpack, and he says, not only is Jesus the greatest revelation of who God is, but he's also our high priest. And he begins to to work out his ministry for us as high priest. And so again, he warns us, and he says, if if you could reject the Levitical priesthood and what the priests under Aaron did, be careful that you don't reject the work of Jesus as our high priest. And he warns us again and calls us to take seriously who Jesus is. And then in chapter 7, he goes, on, he goes back to the ministry of Jesus as a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And, he's, and his point is this. His point is that Jesus Christ himself is able to save us completely, even from the darkest depths of our sin. 
That's the, that's the kind of point that we've climbed to so far in the book of Hebrews. And so it's from this point that the author now launches and begins to tell us about the new covenant that God has prepared for us and promised long ago that we now get to live in together. And so we're going to celebrate that together this, this evening. And so what we're going to do, we're going to read through and we're going to stop about halfway. We're going to look at a few things and then we're going to take our time to go through the actual promises of the new covenant one by one. So let's read together from Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to read from verses 1 all the way to verse 13. Here's what the author says. Here is the main point, that we have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of, mag beside the, throne of the majestic God in heaven. And there he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our high priest must make an offering too. And if he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest since there are already priests who offer the gifts that are required by the law. But they serve in a system of worship that is only a copy. It's a shadow of the real one in heaven. For when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning and he said, be sure that you make everything according to the pattern that I gave you and have shown you here on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better because it is enacted on better promises. Now, if the first covenant had been faultless, there would be no need to, for a second covenant to replace it. But when God found fault with the people, he said, The day is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. This, is the co this covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, and so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. All right, let's pause here for a moment. This is the introduction to the new covenant. This is the author building up to the new covenant, right? And the new covenant is like the crescendo for that. So let's, I want us to just take a moment and notice just a few things in what he's said so far. And he begins right at the beginning in the first couple of verses by recapping what he's established in chapter 7. And then he launches from there. And I want to take us to verse 5 and dwell there for just a moment. In verse 5 he says, The priests, the earthly priests, the Levitical priests, they serve in a system of worship that is only a copy or a shadow of the real one in heaven. And I want to I pause here for a moment because he uses these terms, copy and shadow, as, as illustrative of a type of relationship that exists between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the reason I want to pause here for a moment, this is like pastor confession sessions, Right? There are times that I find frustrating for me as a pastor, difficult for me, when I'm sitting and we're in conversations together and we're chatting together, we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about what God has said, and, and I hear the phrase, yeah, but that's just Old Testament, right? It happens. Maybe you've said it, maybe you've heard people say it, right? It doesn't mean we hate you. It's totally fine. Right? But we say that sometimes as though that phrase in and of itself, as though the fact that what we've just spoken about is in the Old Testament nullifies the importance of what is said in the text, right? that it has no impact on our lives today because it's Old Testament. Some of you may remember Andy Stanley, a reasonably famous preacher in the United States. Right? He infamously said a while back, he said, you need to unhitch the Old Testament from your faith. Poor Andy, when he said that, didn't actually mean we need to dump the Old Testament, which is what a lot of people interpreted him as saying. But he was trying to deal with people who had hang-ups on some of the difficult parts of the Old Testament and telling people to just deal with that later and instead focus on Jesus. But he, he voiced that in an unhelpful way. So you can ditch the Old Testament. You can unhitch it from your faith. But the reality is that the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament is, is a, a significant relationship, and it's an important one. It's one the author's going to come back to at the end of this chapter. But it's also not a simplistic one. You don't just get to say, oh, that's Old Testament. It doesn't really matter anymore. But the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament is much more significant and much more important for us to do that to it. So I want to, I want to illustrate this for you in two ways. The one thing I want to say is in the Old and the New Testament, God doesn't change. What you're reading about God in the Old Testament is the same God that we have in the New Testament. It's the same God that we serve today. So if you see a description of God in the Old Testament, He hasn't changed. He Himself tells us that in my favorite passage of Scripture. 
in Malachi 3, verse 6a, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. Right? The first half of verse 6. The second half of verse 6 says, Therefore you, O Israel, are not consumed by my wrath and anger. Right? But the point is, I, the Lord, do not change. What God reveals of himself in the Old Testament, he is the same God that we have in the New Testament. And he is the same God that you and I live and serve today. But in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, the author introduces a concept that explains some of the ways in which the Old Testament relates to the New Testament. And it's a term that we've called typology. Right? Let me explain that for a moment. Theological term. Typology is the idea that one thing can stand as a representative or a model for another thing. It's where we get the word prototype from. Right? Through typology, events, people, statements in the Old Testament are seen as types that prefigure events or aspects of Christ and his ministry that are described in the New Testament. That might sound quite fluffy at the moment, so let me give you an example to bring it down to earth. How many of you remember the story of Abraham and his son Isaac? Right? It's a story recorded for us in Genesis chapter 22. God says to Abraham, listen, Abraham, I'm going to bless all nations through you. You're going to have so many descendants. You're not going to be able to count them. And the only son that he gets to have these descendants through is his son Isaac. And when Isaac is about 20 years old, the Lord says to Abraham, listen, Abraham, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take Isaac. I want you to take him to the land of of Moriah, I want you to go up the mountain there, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Anyone ever had the Lord ask you to do that? No? Hectic moment. Off Abraham goes uh, with his son Isaac, and they go, and Isaac says to him, Dad, I, like, I see the wood for the sacrifice, but I don't see the animal. What are we going to sacrifice? And Abraham says, listen, son, don't worry about it. God is going to provide, right? Knowing all the while what God has said. And they get up onto the mountain, and Abraham ties Isaac down onto the altar, and he's about to offer his own son up to the Lord. And before he can do that, an angel appears to him and says, okay, wait. And there in the bushes on the side is a lamb that's been caught up in the bushes. And the angel says, you can take your son off the altar and take the lamb and offer it onto the altar to the Lord. Now let's jump forward a few thousand years into the New Testament. Do you remember when John the Baptist sees Jesus for the first time? in the Gospel of John, and he sees Jesus, and what does he say? He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why do you think he calls Jesus the Lamb of God? It was just like a nice term that he just found somewhere and decided to ascribe to Jesus. It's, it's, this is typology. He is seen in the picture of Abraham, Isaac, and the Lamb, a prefiguring of who Jesus is going to be. In addition, you might not know this, but the mount where Jesus was sacrificed, Golgotha, is thought to be the exact same hill where Abraham came to offer Isaac. It's thousands of years later. That's not just coincidence. The lamb in Genesis 22 is for us a type of Christ. It was the redemption through which Isaac was saved. In the same way, Jesus now saves all of humanity. It was a picture for us in the Old Testament of the salvation of God that comes to men. That's the point of Genesis 22. It's not that, you might, that God would say to you, you need to go and offer your child as a sacrifice. That's not what Genesis 22 is trying to teach. It's showing us the salvation of God. It's anticipating the coming of Jesus that's going to come and take away the sin of the world. That's what the author is using here in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. He says the whole system of worship, the temple and the priests and the sacrifices and the offerings, all of these things are foreshadows of their complete counterpart that's found in Jesus. Jesus is the completion of the picture of the Old Testament sacrificial system. He's the completion of the system of worship that was designed to help God's people connect with God. Jesus completes that. He changes that. He is the fullness of that. So there are many examples of this in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We don't have time to dig into all of them tonight. But I want to encourage you to put that phrase out of your vocabulary. Right? You don't get, just get to say, yeah, that's Old Testament. Take a moment and, and ask yourself, how does the Old Testament relate to the New Testament? This? How do I see what, who God is reflected in the Scripture that is still true today? All right. My pastoral confession is now over. We're going to move on. <laughs> 
Okay, we're going to jump to Hebrews 8, verse 7 and 8, right? And I want us to notice just a few things in, uh, in this passage before we jump into the fullness of the new covenant. The first is that the author points out the reason we need a new covenant is because there was a problem with the old covenant, right? Do you see that? If the first covenant had been faultless, there would be no need for a second covenant to replace it. But God found fault with who? The people. Found fault with the people. Right? Remember the wilderness generation that we spoke about a few weeks ago? That God took through out of Egypt and brought them through the Dead Sea and fed them in the wilderness and took them to the promised land? But they didn't remain faithful. They turned away from God. And that's still a problem that people have today. We are a people that turn ourselves away from God. And so the author raises us and he says the problem with the old covenant was that it relied on sinful people to follow God in obedience. And they were unable to do that. And so God recognized there was a need for a new covenant to come into place. Secondly, I want you to notice, and this is just something that's interesting and I think maybe perhaps significant in its interestingness, what we're about to read in the rest of Hebrews chapter 8 is the single longest continuous quotation of the Old Testament in the New. Right? It's four verses from Jeremiah 31, from 31 to 34. And this longest quotation of the Old Testament that we get in the New Testament is the promise of God's new covenant with his people. I think that's a beautiful thing. The most important thing that the authors took from the Old Testament into the New is that we would see the promise of God and how we relate to Him under that New Covenant. Finally, and before we move into the covenant in itself, I want you to notice the last two lines in verse 8 there. Right? It says, I will make this New Covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Now, I want to I want to fill this in for you a little bit because you might not realize that when Jeremiah gave this prophecy, the nation of Judah was about to be taken into exile. They were under the reign of King Josiah. He was the last godly king in the history of Israel. And 20 years later, the whole nation got taken into captivity in Babylon. But if you know your Old Testament history, you'll know that the nation of Israel, the 10 tribes, the northern tribes, they were wiped out by Assyria many years before. At the point that Jeremiah gives this prophecy, the nation of Israel has ceased to exist as a nation. They are no longer a national people. And yet God promises that they too will come under this new covenant. I want to humbly suggest to you that in making that promise, God is foreshadowing his inclusion of the Gentiles, of us, non-Jewish people, into the promise of redemption by God. Something we get to see in the Old Testament. So let's take a moment, let's now read, let's go into the New Covenant and let's see why it's something that we can and should celebrate together. Hebrews 8 from verse 10. But this is the New Covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Here's the first promise. I will put my law in their minds and I will write my laws on their hearts. Now, if you've been in church for a while, you, you probably know this reasonably well, right? You've read this before, you've heard it said. I want us to just pause for a moment and consider what a massive shift this is and what God is doing by making this promise. So let's go back to the first covenant that God gave to the Israelite people and just notice how that went down, right? And this happens in Exodus chapter 24 from verses 7 to 8. And you remember the story that the people of Israel, they've been taken out of captivity in Egypt. God's led them through the Red Sea. He's fed them in the wilderness. They've arrived at Mount Sinai, and the glory of God has been displayed for the whole nation to see. And then Moses goes up the mountain and receives the covenant. And he comes down, and it says this in Exodus 24, 7 and 8. Then he took the book of the covenants, Moses, and he read it to the people. And they responded, we will do everything that the Lord has said. We will obey. Then Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. This is the people. That, the Springboks have just won the World Cup, right? They're on a high. God has just done an incredible work of salvation and redemption for them out of slavery in Egypt and he's taking them through a sea. He's miraculously provided for them. And so now when he calls them to obey what he wants them to do, 
Then they're excited and they say, yes, Lord, we are in. We will do everything that you have asked of us. You remember how that turned out? Right? We read about it in chapter 3. They got to the promised land, and God said, all right, guys, here's the land I want to give you. Go into the land. Conquer the land. Take hold of your possession. And they go, and they look at the land, and they go, no, we're not going to go in there. The guys are big in there. We're all going to die. Let's rather die in the wilderness. How long did their faithfulness last? A few weeks? Maybe a few months? Do you remember the days before you knew Jesus, if you're here tonight as a Christian. And how sometimes you want to make a change in your life. You, you want it to be a better person. You want it to be fitter. You want it to be nicer. You want it to change some aspects of your personality and deal with some habits that you were wrestling with. Some of you are thinking, what do you mean, remember, Brad? We're, we're still doing that right now. Right? And you would try and try and try, and you never managed to create sustainable change in your life. Because before Jesus enters your life, your heart is not neutral. But your heart is engraved with sin. And the inclinations of your heart are sinful. And the natural bend and direction of your heart is to disobey God and to move away from Him and to be in rebellion to Him. This was the same for the Israelites throughout their history. They never had the redemption of the Spirit, they weren't born again. They didn't get the new covenant. Their hearts were engraved with sin and their temptations and intentions were always sinful and their journey with God was constantly fighting the sinfulness that was engraved into their heart in order to try their best to be faithful. That was how it worked. But God declares in the new covenant that we now get to live in, that instead of our hearts being engraved with sin, that they will be engraved in the ways of righteousness and in his truth. How wonderful is that? How wonderful is that, that no longer is every inclination of our heart sinful, but in the new covenant, as God is at work within us, changing us and transforming us to be more and more like Jesus, that the inclinations of the redeemed heart begin to become towards obedience to God. That's the beauty of this promise that God will put his law into our minds and write them onto our hearts. So that because we, we be, he begins to do that in us, we as his people begin to live in more and more of his favor because we're living in obedience to him. Because our natural desires as the spirit is at work in us now lead us towards God rather than away from him. And as we spend more time with him, he makes us more and more like him. And unlike that wilderness generation, we actually have the ability to begin to follow God in faithfulness. Isn't that wonderful? That's the first promise in the new covenants. He, here's the second. He says, I will be their God and they will be my people. In the new covenant, we get to be God's people. And he says, I am your God. This is another amazing promise. And some of you might be thinking, hold on, Brad, hold on just a second. I feel like God says this about his people in the Old Testament already, that they were already his people. And you'd be right. right good job on knowing your Bibles. But the meaning in the new covenant is so much deeper than that. It moves from something that was very corporate to something that's quite personal and a lot more intimate. See, under the old covenant, when God said this to his people, what it did is it created for them a national identity. And it separated them from the other peoples of the world and said, this people alone has exclusive access to the God of heaven. They're the only ones who know how to worship me and how to follow me. But in many ways, for the average Israelite, God remained quite separate from them. See, he dwelt in the most holy place in the temple. But you couldn't go there. Right? Only the high priest could go into the temple and the high, into the most holy place. And the, most, the priest... The high priest could only go into the most holy place once a year. And before he went, he had to spend a week purifying himself because if he went into that place with any kind of sin in his life, then he would immediately be struck down by the righteous glory of God. So he would go in with a rope around him in case they needed to pull his corpse out. There were times in the Old Testament where because of their rebellion, God turns his back on his people. We read about that again in chapter 4. 
They were still his people, and he was still their God, but it was quite a transcendent relationship. Right? God was above them and beyond them and largely inaccessible to them on a personal level. As we come to the new covenant, God transforms that. And he makes it so much more personal and intimate. And I want to read to you from Revelation 21 that gives us the final picture of the culmination of this promise. Right? When it gets realized for us in fullness, this is what it's going to look like. John writes this and he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. There's the promise again. Notice how it finishes. It says this, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Remember in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 where God is in the garden and Adam and Eve are in the garden and God is walking and Adam and Eve are walking and they're just there together and they're just able to have conversation. That's the promise that God is coming to reestablish, that once again he will be with his people, he will be present with us. And we will be able to see him and talk to him and know him in fullness. Amen. What a blessing. But this is not just a promise for one day when we go to be with the Lord and he redeems all creation. There are so many places in the New Testament that begin to show us how we are able to realize this blessing even now. In John 17, Jesus prays for his disciples and he says this. He says, my prayer is not just for them alone, for the 12 alone, but I also pray for those who will believe in me because of their message. And I pray that they may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, that they may also be in us. Just as Jesus was in the Father and the Father was in him, Jesus says that we all would be in him as well. That we would know the same level of intimacy with the Father that Jesus did. You picture that. Matthew 28, verse 20, the Great Commission. Right? All of you who are good Christians, you're going to recite the Great Commission. Right? Step one. But that promise at the end of the Great Commission says this. It says, surely I will be with you always. In fact, it says, surely I am with you always. Even to the very end of the age. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, And he's talking to them, and he says, guys, you need to understand this. You need to understand in light of the sin you're committing, but you need to know and understand this, that when you are united with the Lord, you become one with him in spirit. The word that he uses means to literally weld or to fuse something together. That when you become a Christian, that God's spirit fuses himself to your spirit, and the two of you become one together. That's the promise of God in the new covenant. It's just a few examples. But our God is no longer far away. He's no longer inaccessible and separated from us by a curtain that we can't pass through. We don't need to raise loud noises to get his attention, but he is right with us always. And we are his people. What a blessing is that. Here's the third promise. You ready for this one? And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you need to know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. We will all get to know God. Let's take a moment and just put this into perspective, because sometimes we can take this lightly. See, in the old covenant, the priests and the scribes taught you the law, kind of like I'm doing now. And then the prophets would come and call you to repentance and tell you that if you were obedient to God in your repentance, these are the promises of God that you could look forward to enjoying. And then you would go to the temple and you would offer sacrifices to atone for your sin and to say thank you to God, but you just get to come to the temple and then you hand over your your offering to the priest. You give your lamb or your cow or your ox to the priest and he would take it inside to the altar. And then he would slaughter it there and he would do the thing with the Lord and then he would come up and he would say, be blessed, my son, your sins are forgiven. But you didn't get to go and to be with God. 
and largely for the average Israelite, that was your knowledge of God. That was what you were taught. That's what you got to see of God. But again, in the new covenant, the knowledge that we have to know God with is much more about intimate, personal experience. No longer will we just know about God, but we will know Him because He will t- personally teach us and show, us to, show Himself to us. Jesus says, my sheep will know my voice. You'll be able to know and recognize the voice of God speaking to you. The creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who sustains all creation, will speak to you in a voice that you can hear and understand. He tells his disciples in John 14, as he's about to go to be crucified, he says, but you guys don't need to worry because the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And he will remind you of everything that I have already told you. The Holy Spirit of God, very God himself, will come and be your personal teacher and sit down with you and say, you know what, Brad, this is the way you need to go. Brad, this is the way in which you need to honor me. James, this is how you need to make a decision in this situation. You get to know God like that. Paul writes later in 1 Corinthians, Right to the Corinthian church, he says, you guys know how it's written that no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor heart has even begun to imagine what God has prepared for those who love him? Well, he has news for you, that God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, Paul says, even the deep things of God, and then he begins to reveal that to us as his people. Isn't that incredible? See, in the new covenant, we will know God not just because we know about him, but because we will know him personally. We will be able to speak to him and hear from him. He himself will lead us by his spirit into truth and righteousness. God has made his relationship with us personal. You don't need to be a priest or a prophet. You don't need to be a pastor in a church to have a relationship with God. You don't need to go into confession and speak to a priest and ask him to mediate on your behalf because you can come right before the Father yourself. You can come boldly before the throne of grace. That's the promise of God in the new covenant. You get to come to God personally. I mean, that is absolutely incredible, isn't it? Just for those of you who are excited and you're like, no, I don't need to come to church anymore. We don't need to do... Like, I don't need to hear teaching because God's going to teach me himself, right? That's not what's happening here, right? Teaching gifts are still honored and spoken about in Scripture. But this is about, on, on the whole, all of us now get to relate personally to God. You get to know him, not because you've read about him, but because you experience him and you know him at work in your own life. That's the new covenant. <clears throat> Here's the last promise. This promise is the climax of the whole of the new covenant. It's the foundation on which the whole of the new covenant stands. And it goes like this. It says, For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. Praise Jesus. I want you to notice the first word in that promise. Right? It says for. It means because. This promise is the, is the reason that the, the other three are all able to happen. It's the basis on which they're all able to stand. Remember in verse 7 how the author said that God found fault in the old covenant, and the fault was that the people were sinful. That was the problem. God wanted to be with his people, and he wanted them to know him like he is able to know us now, but it was unable to happen because of the sinfulness that existed in the people of God. Because whilst they were still sinful, God was unable to give them any of the blessings that he desired to give them in the new covenant. Because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And he cannot join himself to someone who is indebted in sin. He can't do it. He's too holy. He's too righteous. It cannot happen. And so sin became this eternal barrier that separated man from God. That's what happened in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned before the Lord. Sin entered the world and the relationship that they'd enjoyed was cut off and an angel stood between them and God. And they weren't able to enter because sin had entered. So the work of Jesus in the new covenant is the one and only way that God could take that sin and deal with it completely. 
See, the old covenant did some of this, but it never fully dealt with sin. There was a day in the old covenant that the people of Israel would, would observe every year. It was called the Day of Atonement. It was a beautiful day in the Old Testament calendar, and the whole nation would gather together, and the priest would do the thing where he would prepare himself for a week beforehand, and he would go into the most holy place, but then he would have to atone for the sins of the people. And so they would get two animals, usually two goats, and one of them would have the sins of the people spoken over it, and we would all watch as this goat had the sins of the people spoken over it, and then the blood of the people spoken poured out over the goat, and the goat would be sent into the wilderness. That's where we get the picture of scapegoat from, by the way. And you'd watch this goat leave with your sin into the wilderness. And God was cleansing his people of their sin, but we were also being reminded constantly of your sin. Year after year after year, you were shown this is your sin being atoned for again. You constantly needed your sin atoned for. And the problem was, though, that even though your sin got atoned for, you could go home at the end of the ceremony of the, the Day of Atonement and get into an argument with your wife and sin against the Lord and what you've now done. And suddenly you need more atonement because what's happened is only done what's passed. And so the, the Old Covenant dealt with sins that were committed but could never deal with the root problem, the fact that there was sin engraved on our heart. We're going to deal with that more in chapter 9. We're going to see more of that in Hebrews and finally, in the Old Covenant, you might not recognize this, but you, you know there was actually no forgiveness for serious sin? If you murdered someone under the Old Covenant, you got stoned. If you raped someone under the Old Covenant, you got stoned. If you committed adultery under the Old Covenant, you got stoned. In fact, if you killed someone by accident under the Old Covenant, then you could flee to one of four nearby cities of refuge. And if you happened to get there in time, then people weren't allowed to kill you until you, like the next year of Jubilee. Then you could rejoin society. That happened every 50 years. But if they killed you before you got to the city of refuge, that was in their right to do. Right? That was the extent of forgiveness that existed under the Old Covenant. Do you remember David, the king of Israel, the godly man, Right? The man who was humble and, and had a heart after God. When he sinned with Bathsheba and committed adultery, and then he added onto that the murder of her husband Uriah. And then Nathan comes to point it out to him. Do you know when that happens? The just result for David would have been death by stoning. That's what the law required. And so he falls on his face and he begs the Lord to show him mercy. And he, says, and he has to call out to God because there's no provision in the law for his forgiveness. But his sin must be met by punishment. God does forgive him, but it costs him. It costs him the birth of his child. See, the old covenant could never fully deal with sin. And so it could never fully achieve the level of communion and relational restoration that God desires to have with us as his people. So a new covenant was necessary. And so in the new covenant, Jesus comes and he removes all of our sin from us once for all time so that his sacrifice cleanses us completely so that God is able to fully forgive us from all of our sins and choose to remember them no more. And now we're able to know him. Now we're able to be known by him. Now he's able to come and to be with us and be amongst us because our sin has been dealt with. Because Jesus has taken it onto himself. That is the beauty of the new covenant. Isn't that worth praising him for? We're going to do that in just a moment. The author closes with this last verse, verse 13. Is when God speaks of a new covenant, it means that he made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. It says, now that the new covenant has been inaugurated, the old one is done. It's finished. It's obsolete. And I want you to notice that's the old covenant, not the Old Testament. All right? The Old Testament is still helpful. The old covenant has now been replaced. We're no longer bound by the Old Covenant. We no longer relate to God by the terms of the Old Covenant. We relate to God through the New Covenant that has been organized and inaugurated through Jesus and of which He is the mediator. And through that covenant, we get to be made like Him. 
We get to come to know him, and he is our God, and we get to be his people, and our sins are wiped away by the grace and the blood of Christ. Praise the Lord for the wonderful God that we serve. So, James and the team, if you guys want to come up, we're going to go into a time of worship, and we're going to celebrate Jesus, and we're going to lift him high enough. I'd love to invite you to do that, to just recognize the greatness of what God has done for you. And David, David, when he praises the Lord, when, when the Ark of the Covenant is restored to Israel, and he's, he's praising God for what he has done, and his wife comes to him and she says, Dave, you know, you look a bit ridiculous in the way in which you're worshiping God right now. And he says, honey, I'm going to get even more undignified than this because God is worthy of my praise. I want you to feel free to offer God praise that is worthy of his name tonight. Let's, let's lift him up and honor him and rejoice in him. And if you're here tonight and this whole Jesus thing is a little bit foreign to you, maybe you've come to church a few times Maybe you, you flirted with the idea of Christianity, but you're sitting now and you know that you don't, be, you don't yet follow Jesus. I want to say there's an invitation for you tonight to come and meet Jesus. I would love to introduce you to him. The people that you might be sitting next to would love to introduce you to Jesus. And so if you are here and you hear God's little voice poking at the back door of your mind, don't ignore it. Finding Jesus is the most wonderful thing you could do. And you can enjoy all of these blessings in the new covenant by choosing to turn your life over to him and say, Jesus, I need your forgiveness for my sins that have separated me from you. And I want to know what it is like to be your person, to be a part of your people and to have you as my God. That's an opportunity that you have tonight. So we're going to worship. And if whilst we're worshiping you want to do that, please feel free to come and chat to us or to chat to someone near you. Anyone who's here who loves Jesus knows how to introduce you to him. And we'd love to do that for you tonight because that's the greatest thing, the greatest decision that you could ever make. I'm going to pray for us, and then James, you're going to lead us into a time of worshiping God. <clears throat> oh, Jesus, thank you so much for what you have done for us. God, we have tried and tried and tried our best to find our way to you. And we have fallen short over and over and over again. Thank you, Lord, that you saw the sinfulness of our hearts. And you came, God, and you said, I'm going to take away your heart of stone. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to remove the engraving of sin on your heart. And I'm going to write my law there instead. And I'm going to turn your bend towards me. I'm going to welcome you into my presence because I'm going to have washed all of your sin away. And I'm going to love being with you. And I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. Thank you, Jesus, for the wonder of the new covenants. Thank you that we get to know you and to love you and to follow you in the fullness of the Spirit of God that is in us and joined to us. Thank you that you choose to work out your purposes in this world through us. And that one day we will get to be with you in fullness and completeness and know what it was like back in the garden, but even better. We bless you for that, God. We want to honor you and praise you and lift you up and give you all the glory that you deserve tonight, God. So come and be glorified in this place, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, James. Amen. Let's stand as we worship our King.